Hi and welcome to Meste Films Production. I am Vianlex Meste and I'll be your host for tonight. Today we have a very special actor. His name is Ron Bush and he is very an accomplished actor and you're gonna get so much information that you're gonna be blown away. Thank you so much for coming, Ron. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you, especially because you're coming from New York, so. Yeah, it's really a bit of a it. travel day today. <laughs> it's a travel day. All right, Ron, let's start from the beginning. You study business. Yes. You got a really good job, and then something happened. Uh, yeah, um, I got my MBA uh, from Georgia State University in 2007, and uh, was unemployed for a little while, but uh, I got a job working for the Smithsonian Institution in Arlington, actually. Okay. And um, I worked for a small office there, uh, the Office of Investments, where I was essentially a glorified secretary. I was mm -hmm. an administrative specialist to the chief investment officer, but I was making appointments, answering phones, getting coffee, setting up meetings, that oh, kind of stuff. Yeah. So it was kind of boring and, you know, just frustrating because I was sitting there doing nothing a lot of the time, you know, literally clocking in at 9 a.m. and as soon as 5 p.m. hit, walking out the door. So I wasn't really happy with that. And I was happy when I was in Atlanta when I was working on movies. Okay. I did background for a bunch of movies. Uh, the Medea series, I did two or three of their movies. Uh, the first movie I did was Sweet Home Alabama in 2002. And I loved doing that. So I figured since I wasn't happy in my job, maybe I'd get back into acting and see you know, if that helped. And it did. You know, I got to the point where I was finally happier doing the acting than I was going to work. So I just decided to kind of throw the job away and say, you know what, I would rather be happy and poor than, you know, miserable getting up, you know, and commuting an hour and a half each way to work. Wow, yeah. You know, and being miserable every day. So. Now, was that a really, like, scary situation, like, to take that step to say, okay, I'm going to quit my job, which a lot of people will love my job, <laughs> and, and the security of having a job and going to the acting world? Yes and no, because um, I prepared for it. Okay. You know, I started saving money you know, as soon as I made the decision that I was going to leave my job, um, and I actually picked up a second job working at Domino's delivering pizzas. Okay. So all of that money pretty much went into my savings pot for you know, like when I finally decided to quit the job. You know, I wanted to have at least you know, six, $7,000 saved up as my cushion. Okay. And uh, I quickly found out, though, after leaving my job, that that cushion didn't last very long. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, especially in actor, acting world, that yeah. is a struggling world. We all know. Yes. So, um, describe what was your like your next step. You quit your job. You save money, and then what you do? Um, well, I had learned early on doing background work that networking and talking to people is the only way that you're going to get information. Yeah. Okay. You know, so anytime a movie came through or a TV show came through, I tried to do background on it so I could talk to the other actors, find out how they found out about the movie, who, what agents they deal with, uh, where do they find their casting notices. And I would always have a pad and pen on me so I could write everything down, you know, and then at the end of the day, I would go back and sign up on all of those websites that they told me about and keep a list of contacts for the agencies that they told me about because I mean, word of mouth is key in our industry, okay. you know, because there are good agents, there are bad agents, but when someone tells you about their personal experience with an agent saying that they were great, then they're like, oh, wow, okay, then I definitely want to work with that agent. Exactly. So it's more, you know, it's initially it was finding out where the casting notices were. You know, so it was talking to the other actors and saying, where do you go to find your casting notices? And luckily, you know, a lot of them were really nice and were like, oh, yeah, I go to Casting Networks or Casting New York or uh, Brian Dragonuck's website, you know. So I was able to get a lot of information during background. Now, networking, how important do you think it is? I mean, if you're shy, well, why do you think about <laughs> that? Well, if you're shy, um, you're going to have a problem being an actor mm -hmm. <laughs> just because yeah. like, I don't do theater. I uh, haven't yet. I'm going to eventually. But if you do theater, I mean, you're in front of dozens, hundreds of people and it's live. So, I mean, you can't really be shy because you're going to have to get over that real fast. And same thing with uh, TV and movies. You know, like even though you don't really have that big audience in front of you, they're behind the camera, you still have to do a lot of things that might seem odd. Mm -hmm. in real life, you know, oh. so you kind of need to look at it and be like, all right, if you think it's going to look good, then I'll, all right, I'll do it, you know, even though it seems kind of weird. Now, do the other actors kind of talk to you? I mean, you are their competition. Do, are they friendly? Do, you know, 
to get information out and what they're doing? And some yes, some no. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can usually p tell pretty quickly on set, you know, like the people who are willing to talk to you and the ones that aren't. You know, the ones, you know, that kind of are a little standoffish or, you know, if they're, they brought a book and they don't want to be bothered, they just want to sit there and read their book, you know, that's fine. But then there's a lot of people, you know, that are, hey, how you doing? What's your name? You're like, how'd you find this place? Where are you mm -hmm. from? You know, do you do this all the time? You know, so there's n never a lack of people that are willing to talk to you. And, you know, once you find those right people and you get the right information, then it's well, pretty easy from there. And I think in every job, you know, there's some friendly people and they're not so friendly people. Uh, yeah, so. you know, like, I don't mind competition. You know, I got two of my great friends, uh, Gabriel Voss and Altoro Black, they are excellent actors. And usually when I go to an audition here in Baltimore, I see one of them there. And when I do, I kind of roll my eyes because I know, you know, <laughs> one of them is probably going to wind up getting the job. But that, I think, brings me up another level. You know, exactly. and I like to think that at the same time, it brings, you know, when they see the same faces coming in every day, knowing that, okay, they like this person, and they, you know, he's obviously doing something right in the interview or auditions, which is why they keep bringing him back, so now i got to step up my game. Tell me how important it is, because a lot of people, a lot of actors make the mistake that they don't take um, jobs that don't pay. They think right off they're going to make a lot of money, but your resume is important, so what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of people that say, if you work for nothing, that's what you're worth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, if all you do is background work, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone that's willing to give you the lead role in a Hollywood movie. You know, if you join, you get your three vouchers and you join SAG and okay, you've done 20 background movies, but you have no speaking roles. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a whole lot of auditions because there are thousands and thousands of actors that have had at least one speaking role, if not multiple speaking roles who are going to wind up being more qualified. So in the beginning, you have to do all of those non-paying roles. I mean, if you look at my resume, I think I've got 23 movies on there. Three or four of them paid me. Okay. You know, the other 20 were all, you know, deferred payment. You know, if the movie made money, then I made money. Yes. But, you know, most of the time they don't make money, and all you're getting is, you know, IMDb credit and a copy of the movie. Which is good. That yeah. I do. Yeah, it is. And as a casting director, I could tell you, we look through the through the resume, and it, it makes it different when you see that they work in independent films, they in done commercials. I mean, you need to build up your resume. I think it's really important. Yeah. So take the <laughs> take the job even if it doesn't pay. Yeah, you know, like I said, you know, like some things, you know, like a commer a non-paying commercial. I might think twice about doing just mm -hmm. because if a company is going to make money off of me, absolutely. Then you know. I'd I should be getting 50 bucks or 25 bucks, a little bit for, for my time. Something. You know, it's different when you're, you know, independent movies, short movies, or uh, TV pilots, you know, those kind of things, you know, you're hoping that the right people are going to see them. So, you know, you're fine with not taking any money or getting paid $20 or $5 for gas to get you to the set, you know, as opposed to... At least to get that back. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know, like, when you want to be an actor, you're thinking of Hollywood, you're thinking of big movies. What do you think of independent films? Um, you know, there, some of them are really great. Some of them not so much. Mm -hmm. But when you have a full cast of really great actors, you know, like, one of the best movies that I worked on was uh, formerly called Leaving Hollywood. They had to change the name. Now it's called uh, Diary of an Ex-Child Star. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a mouthful. But yeah. um, it was a great cast. I mean, there were SAG actors, non-SAG actors. And the people that were working on it were people that had been in the business for a long time and had multiple screen credits and some pretty decently sized independent movies for the Baltimore market. So when you got that number of people together that were great, it made the whole experience great. And... You know, the story was great, and the director was great. So, I mean, it made for an overall great movie. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about your headshots. Because it's, it's important to have headshots, and a lot of people kind of go cheap at first because we're struggling actors. What What's your input about that? Yeah. Do they go cheap at first? Um, well, again, yes and no. Um, I wish I would have brought one of my old, my first headshot that I got because... 
it really wasn't all that great. We'll put them. We're going <laughs> to show them so you can see them. So the headshot that I had, that my first headshot, it's kind of, I'm washed out. And if I was going for a role in the Twilight movies, you know, it would have been a perfect <laughs> headshot for that. <laughs> it could but, have been um, Robert. <laughs> yeah. So, but in the beginning, though, you know, it's like sometimes headshots do cost a lot of money. I've paid $600 for headshots from Joe Henson and, you know, $450 for headshots from, uh, Brian James Donnelly and $125 from another photographer in Maryland and you get what you pay for. Exactly. You know, when somebody looks at my Joe Henson headshot, they're like, wow, that is a great shot. You know, I wish I could still use it, but the hair is really short on that one, so okay. I can't Seven. really use yeah. the headshot anymore. But uh, Brian James Donnelly, his headshots, again, you know, like they're really great, you know, especially compared to my first headshot. So, you know, you in the beginning, no, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. All you really need is, you know, something that's that looks like you, you know, and is somewhat of an interesting look, I guess is a way to put it. Mm -hmm. You know, because you want somebody to look at your headshot and be like, oh, that's an interesting person. Call the attention. Exactly. Yeah. Like I always say, your headshot is your representation. Yeah. It's like your business card, you know, like what you do. Yeah. You know, it's the first thing that somebody sees and it's could mean the difference between somebody looking at the back of the headshot and not looking at the back of the headshot. Mm -hmm. So if you have a really bad headshot, you know, it's kind of like, well, you wasted the money anyway, because if no one's going to look at it anyway, they're like, oh, yeah, no. Then well, the headshot also tells you, like, how you look in a film, really. Like, if they yeah. don't look good, we need, unfortunately, there's an industry that we're looking for good-looking people. And if they don't look that good, mm, and you might be very handsome, very pretty, but it's just not showing in your headshot because yeah. you went another way. As long as it looks like you. you know, That's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not really so much of a problem with guys as it is with women because a yes. lot of women, if they get glamour shots done, you know, I get, the pictures look amazing. But when they show up, they're like, oh, well, you're pretty, but it's not quite That has glamorous. happened to me, and it's very scary. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's like because as a casting director, when you're looking for actors to play in your film, you have an image of your character. So when they don't look like themselves, they come in, it's not what you wanted for that character. Yeah. So you have to kind of look a lot like the headshot. Yeah. Walk in there and almost look exactly as the headshot. And like you say, if you got a haircut, you got to get new ones, huh? Yeah. So. Color of the hair, you know, if, uh, my friend Golnara, she just got bangs. You know, uh -huh. so her headshots that she had from before now, you know, are kind of useless just because she she looks a lot different she with does. the hair. Yeah. So, you know, something like that, then yeah, you know. It's a big it, change in a, yeah. Yeah, because my hair in the Johansson headshots was maybe half an inch long, and now, you know, it's a lot longer than that, so. Yeah. All right, well, we have so much to talk about because Ron is just full of information, <laughs> and especially for you guys that want to be actors and don't know a lot about the feel. So stay tuned for next month because we're actually going to talk about New York City and what is it like for additions and everything like that. Have a good night. We'll see you in a bit.